perfect. <laughs> all right, we're now recording. Um, so first of all, once again, I just want to thank you so, so much for being here. We're very grateful to have you on one of our pre-law shadowers uh, session. And um, just to introduce myself, my name is Christiane and I'm a third year student at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. Um, and I would consider myself a pre-law student. I definitely want to go into uh, law school, uh, go into law in the future. And I do want to go to law school. So this is a great opportunity for me to learn and for everyone else watching to learn as well. So um, I can let you introduce yourself and then we'll get on to the questions. I think you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Amy Sandu. I'm a lawyer in Ontario and I was called 21, almost 22 years ago. Um, I, I feel like I've had a very rewarding career personally and I, I hope along the way that I've been able to help people. I've always been a business lawyer um, from the beginning of articling. I knew, or in the middle of articling, um, I knew that was my home, which is totally different from what I thought I was going to do when I was in law school, which is totally different from what I thought I was going to do when I applied to law school. Um, the, I, I currently have my own law firm, Lex Integra, and I only do business law and corporate ethics. I'm one of the few lawyers I know who works in the area of corporate ethics. And in terms of my law career, I did two years on Bay Street in Toronto. Um, I knew early on um, that wasn't my right fit. So I went in-house um, about two years after having two years of uh, practice under my belt. And I basically stayed in-house in different capacities uh, for about 17 years. And then I was laid off two years ago. And then when I was laid off, I decided that I wanted to be my own boss. And so I've been running my own firm ever since. So that's my, my high level. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction and congratulations on your firm. Thank you. um, of course. So before I uh, kind of start with um, more about your legal career itself, I did want to kind of go back a little bit um, and talk about your undergraduate program. I know that you uh, graduated from McGill Law School, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then you did your undergrad at Queens University, which is an amazing. No, I did my I did my graduate work at Queens. I did graduate. my undergrad at U of T. Oh, really? That's awesome. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just wanted to uh, know if you wanted to tell us a little bit about your undergraduate experience, maybe some programs that you majored in, or if there's any sure courses that you think pre-law students should take. Um, so in terms of what pre-law students should take, I mean, I mean. I've always been of the view that reading critically is one of the most important things a law student can do. So as long as your course of study permits you to do that, in my view, that's, that's good training. Um, I can't comment on a field of study I didn't study. Like I can't say if, you know, I, I had classmates who had degrees in French literature, Russian literature, engineering. I had people in my program who had lots of work experience or who graduated after two years of undergrad. So I can't comment on how it was for them, but um, I think generally in terms of a good education, you wanna read widely and read critically because obviously that's a very important part of uh, understanding the law and interpreting the law and advising your clients. Um, in terms of my, my personal journey, um, I can't, totally remember what my degree was in only because I changed my major a couple of times. So it was some, either I did a history specialist in a poli-sci major or a history poli-sci double major or history poli-sci double major minor in women's studies. I, I took all those courses, but I just can't remember what the actual like uh, uh, program designation was. It might've been a history specialist because I went on to do my master's in history. And that was where I went to um, before I went to law school. Um, when I went to do my master's degree, I was fully expect, I was pre-PhD. Like I was fully expecting I'm gonna do my master's, then I'll do my PhD and I'll be a professor. That's what I had thought I was gonna do at that time. 
but I did not, for myself, I did not enjoy graduate school from the point of view of, it's very isolating in the sense that, you know, you could have lots of great friends and great colleagues and collaborators, but like, it's really you and your studies. And I discovered that I like my work to be more social, like more teamwork. And secondly, when you're doing graduate studies, at least in my experience, I was very focused on a very specific topic for a very long time. And I learned I did not have the, that attention span to stay focused on one particular thing for a very long time. So I stuck it out. I finished my graduate degree. Um, and let's see, I finished, it was a one to two year program, depending on how you did it. It took me like 18 months. So I was done like February. And at some point I did apply to law school, but I didn't want to go to law school in September. I wanted to take some time off, but I'm cautious. So I applied to law school thinking, okay, if I can't get in, now I have an extra year to reapply. And I have found the law school application process very difficult, like even harder than law school. So once I got in, I was like, I'm not taking that year off because I have to reapply. And that's the hardest thing in the world. So I decided to go. So what that meant in my case is that I did nine consecutive years of university. So I, I don't I don't really recommend that. Nine or ten years. Yeah, nine years. So I'm, you know, I'm not saying that's the way it should be for other people. Um, it just that's just how it worked out for me. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. And also, um, I was wondering maybe if you can elaborate on why the law school admission process was hard. I mean, that was my uh, next question, um, especially like if, if it was the LSAT, um, is that hard? What, like how was it? So I did, my, I did my LSAT in my third year of undergrad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did okay. Like, I don't know if the test is the same now. Like, I think I got 78th percentile. And I thought, okay, I'll apply it, you know, at, but at that point, I didn't, like, I went to graduate school instead. So by the time I applied to law school, my LSAT school, my LSATs were three or four years old. So I kind of thought, okay, I'll see if I get in. And if I don't get in, I'll rewrite the LSAT. I mean, like, who wants to do it more than once? Uh, so I actually surprised myself that I got in. I mean, I got in everywhere I applied. So clearly my application package was strong. Um, in terms of why was it so complicated? I mean, you're going to laugh. Um, computers weren't necessarily easy to use or easy to have. And I'm pretty sure a lot of the applications had to be typed. No, no, I know. Sorry. I was using a computer. I think the applications had to be typed. And I'm like, I can't type. Like, I don't have a typewriter. So I had to like hire an actual service to help me type up the forms because they weren't necessarily online. And so it, it wasn't so much the, the content. It was more the assembly, the assembly of everything. And I think, I mean, I think we had to submit photographs. I could be totally wrong about that, but it just seemed like there's a lot of cutting and, you know, there was, the, there was a content piece, but there was the document production piece and there was the assembly piece and um, keeping all the deadlines straight and the multiple uh, uh, applications to be submitted. For, for whatever reason, in addition to the content, it just sort of seemed like a lot. And I was studying at, at the same time. And I think, um, I think, you had a question about the uh, um, the personal statement. I think personal statements are really hard as well because you're really exposing yourself. And what's interesting about you or what about you might really contribute to a great uh, law school class is not really obvious to you. So you, when you're writing this, you know, it's just like the arc of an essay, right? Oh, I'm so excited. I'm going to write this. Hmm, I'm starting to struggle. I'm going up a hill. Oh my God, this is the worst thing that anyone's ever written in the world. I'm going to throw it in the garbage and start all over again. And then, you know what? Maybe it's not so bad. So I think, I think, and you compound that because you're talking about yourself, which I think many people 
probably find quite difficult to do. It's like that whole thing when you hear your, a recording of your own voice. So I don't know how much of that is relevant to the application process today. Like definitely a younger or a more recent graduate from law school would be uh, would be better to listen to on this topic because, you know, I would have applied like 1995, 1994, something like that. My first year of law school was 1995. Yeah, um, I, I do believe that a lot of the things that you said are, are still relevant, especially the personal statement. Um, and like you said, I hate writing about myself every time in high school or even in university where we have to like talk about ourselves. It's the worst because I just totally like I blank out. <laughs> so that's going to be quite interesting to write. But um, anyway, moving on <laughs> um, and about your lot, like I just want to know a little bit about your law school experience. Um, you know, I'm sure part of it was daunting. Part of it was really exciting. Obviously, it's nothing like what we see in TV shows or movies. So if there's any, you know, misconceptions about law school that you think should be addressed. Um, yeah, just about your law school experience. Uh, well, generally speaking, I've never enjoyed it. I don't, I don't, I've never really watched TV shows about law, except like Law and Order, but never, I didn't watch Ally McBeal. I didn't watch Suits and everything in Street Legal that uh, I, I never watched those shows. I saw Legally Blonde, that was good. Um, and the only law show I've ever watched, which is hilarious, it's called Grinders or Grinder, The Grinder, Rob Lowe stars in it and Fred Savage. It only lasted for one season and it's a comedy. You might find it on Netflix or something. And the premise is there's this really handsome brother who's like a TV star and he plays a lawyer on TV. And then the show ends and for whatever reason, and they explain it in the show, he goes back to the small town where he's from. And his dad and his brother are both lawyers. The dad has a law firm, the brother's working at the law firm. And the, you know, the son, the, 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 the younger son is like working hard, right? But the father favors the actor son. And the actor son, like people treat him like he's a lawyer, even though he only played a lawyer on TV. And that's the premise of the show. And it's actually really well done. And how you see the younger brother working, like that's more true to life. Um, so if you're ever looking for your next Netflix show, if it's still on Netflix, that's a pretty funny show. Um, in terms of my law school experience, I mean, overall, I had a great time. Um, I don't, I didn't study in, an, in a good enough way. Like I, I, I employed too many of my undergraduate study habits. So I didn't have enough, um, I, I should have been doing more every day and not cramming, Let, let's just put it that way. Um, and secondly, I really struggled in first year in understanding how to write a law exam. So basically I had spent six years in university writing essays, right? Undergrad and graduate school. And then I got to law school and I basically treated every law exam, okay, I'm gonna write an essay. So I missed the boat because that is not what, you know, maybe if you're writing an essay in a law course, that's what you should do. And at that time, there was more and more recognition that 100% final exams might not have been the best way or shouldn't be the only way to evaluate students. Okay, thank you. Um, so I did the essays when it was an optional thing to do or when it was available and that helped my grades. But in the exam only courses, I really struggled. Uh, I think it was not until like second year or even like the second half of second year where I finally understood oh that's what you want me to do on the exam because I just a I didn't get it but because there were 100 percent exams I didn't know I didn't get it until I got the exam results back and then I'm like what just happened why why do my exam results look like this I understood the material I did the readings um, but I really I really struggled because I kept writing my law school exams as if I was writing my undergrad exams so I think that 
you know, I don't know if you guys do a program on what a law exam is for, you know, how to approach law exams. I think it's hard to explain to people, but basically, roughly speaking, and now I teach business law at Ryerson to undergrads. And so I try to, you know, we try to teach them this, that when you're writing an answer, right? There's, there's the issue, like, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? What is the issue, right? And then like what, what laws or what legal principle apply to your issue? And then finally, and, then, and somewhere in there are the facts, they might be given to you in the, in the fact pattern in the question, but the really important or equally important or most important part is how do you apply the law slash legal principles to the facts of your case? And it was that last bit that I just, I really struggled with that. So I would sort of get lost in describing the law or describing the legal principles and theorizing about the legal principles and was it a good legal principle? All that's interesting, but that's not what the exam question was asking me to do. So that was something that um, I, found, I found very difficult. Um, hopefully law school courses are not 100% finals anymore. I don't know. Uh, but that that was something and it, and it's hard on your ego right like in the one hand you're used to performing in a certain way you know maybe like for some of you the move from high school to undergrad could be like that um but in law school again you're just you're going into this new environment you know everyone's bright and then you doubt if you are bright and uh we had a, a young associate dean at that time um and i remember so law school started in September, probably end of September, beginning of October. There was like a school assembly for under for the first years. And he said something, you know, some of you have come to talk to me to see, you know, you don't know if you belong here. And he said, I'm not worried about you. He said, I'm worried about all of you who didn't come to talk to me to have this conversation. I think it's I think it's very common when you go on to do something like that, that you feel like you don't belong. But the worst thing is if you feel like that in isolation, if you think, oh, I'm the only one who feels this way, when it's widespread, probably everyone feels that way. And, it, you know, so it's good to have a community that supports you. It's good if you had some of that community in your studies. It's also good to have that support outside of your studies, because sometimes you do need to get away from it to get a bit of perspective. And that's that would be the same no matter what you're studying or no matter what stage of life you're at. That's amazing advice. That all of that was so insightful. Oh my goodness. <laughs> like even the whole idea between um, you know, a law exam, but then or a law essay or an essay in a law class. Um, I think the whole application thing really stood out to me, especially because I've been I struggle with that sometimes. I'll get lost in summarization. And then when it comes to application, I just, I don't include it. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then, and then what you said at the end, um, reassurance. I've definitely felt like that when I went from high school to university. And I think it'll definitely be the same thing if I end up going to oh, law. For sure. And then you're going to feel like that when you work or anytime there's a new job or a promotion opportunity. You know, I mean, now I guess we have a name for it, imposter syndrome. And I, I do find the writing around imposter syndrome really interesting because there was this like upswelling of talking about it and writing about it. And then I also like reading the people who say, you know what, I don't like imposter syndrome because it's putting all the onus on the person as opposed to maybe looking at the structure and the systems that might be contributing to people to feel that way, especially if they're coming from marginalized communities, you know? So, you know, take everything, take everything with a grain of salt. And that goes back to what I said in the beginning about reading critically, mm -hmm. right? Like even with my, with my little kids, they'll tell me something and I'm like, what is your source, <laughs> right? They're like nine. They're like, well, the source is YouTube, some random person on YouTube. I'm like, what is the source? <laughs> what is the source? What is that person's motivation and putting that video up there, mm -hmm. you know? And you got it. And, so, and we're seeing it more and more with people, I guess, with fake news. You really need to always remember to like validate the sources of the information um, even if it, even if it's saying what you want it to say, 
you should still validate like where is this coming from for sure critical thinking i mean we 100 percent. Yeah, i'm in political science i'm majoring in political science and that's especially in third year we do a lot of critical thinking and it's an amazing tool to use especially absolutely you'll never not you'll never not use it exactly yeah for sure thank you so Sorry, much my face that. is so itchy i don't know why it must be really dry <laughs> in this house now You're that i'm thinking about it, i can't yeah now that i'm thinking about it, i can't stop doing it <laughs> don't think about it um so the next question is more about uh what you do now. And I was reading your website and um, I know that you're an entrepreneur, you're a lawyer, you're the founder and the principal lawyer of, uh, lawyer of Lex Integra, which is a law firm that um, focuses on business law and uh, corporate ethics. And I wanted to know what exactly that entails and maybe what a typical day in your career looks like. Okay, so, I, so I've had my firm for two years and so uh, quickly basically it builds upon all the things that I've done before would be a, a, a summarized way of saying it so my parents are immigrants from India and so almost everybody in my family was an entrepreneur of some kind now it's really sexy to use the word entrepreneur then we just call them small business owners Right. And so I grew up in a grocery store in the corner, helping my mom stock the shelves and watch the cash register and like, you know, mop the floor, take the garbage out. Um, so I feel like what I do now is partly um, trying to take that sense of business risk, like I'm going to make this business work. The other so. So that's so the entrepreneurial uh, um, mindset or something I grew up with. I was never interested in being an entrepreneur until more recently. And now I'm really glad that I've done this because like, I really feel like once it's like any kind of education, like nobody can take that experience away from you. And it really is like another building block of knowledge and experience that you have and you can go back to and use again and again. Um, in terms of the actual legal work, um, so I do a lot of basically in-house counsel services and many business lawyers will say they do some variation of that. But what it means to me is for some companies, they might not have a legal department, so they will use me. And so um, a lot of the work is contract review, contract negotiation. So basically the companies are buying and selling stuff. So for some of us buying and selling stuff is like business to consumer. Um, generally speaking, generally speaking, not 100%, but generally speaking, my clients are all B2B, they're all business to business. So maybe they're buying um, a bridge. Maybe they're buying a power plant. Maybe they're selling a power plant. So those typically tend to be more my kind of clients. So I will help them with the negotiations and writing of the contract. Um, also as part of in-house counsel services, um, you're often someone that they can talk to about the business, about business issues. If you're, if you were, like when I, when I was in-house counsel, I might have done the business stuff. I might have done some of the HR stuff. I might have done some of the lease stuff. I might have done some of the investigation stuff. I might have done slip and falls. And so the idea is that rather than as a company outsourcing all of that to a law firm, they would have their own lawyers. And so I take, so the approach of an in-house counsel lawyer is always gonna be different from the approach of a private practice lawyer. Um, private practice lawyers tend to be more like, well, I researched the law, here's my memo. I, I think this applies to you, I'm not really sure, because they don't really understand the business the same way an in-house counsel lawyer does. So how do I avoid that, that situation right now? So when I meet with my clients, I try to spend as much time as they will, they will give me trying to understand their business. Like, what is their business? Like, why, what are they trying to do in this world? Um, and what is, what is the problem? What do they see as the problem? And what do they see as the solution? So in my experience, being an in-house lawyer means you're more integrated with the business. You understand what their business is. 
So I offer those services and then I do, uh, I work with um, startups or smaller businesses. Um, for that, it's, it's not the main part of my business. So I'm a bit more, um, you know, I can't take on that many clients like that because I have, I have bigger clients. And so for the smaller clients, I'll kind of do more of an analysis of, oh, is their business something that I can really get behind? Like, is that a business that like, I'd like to be a part of and I'd like to work with them. So I don't necessarily take on all the clients that might present themselves. Like one of my one of my clients, um, you know, she she makes clothing like um, for for black and brown women. So that's her whole business model. And so I can get excited about that and I can see the impact she's having in her community. And so I want to I want to get behind that. You know, there's other potential clients that have come up where maybe maybe their thing is some kind of like recreational game or just something that I'm like, you know what, that's not really speaking to me at this moment. Um, most of my clients now and, and for the last like almost 20 years have been in the power or infrastructure industries. I, I really get excited about that. Like I really, for me, it's always really important that I feel connected to what my employer does or what my clients do. Like, do I, do I see myself in that? Like if they're building a road, I'm like, wow, like we need working roads. We need to alleviate traffic congestion. Like I wanna be part of these things that make society and make life better. And then, sorry, and then finally I do the ethics and compliance piece. Um, <clears throat> I have I had a very unique experience where I spent six or seven years, I was a senior member of the ethics and compliance department at s Lavalin as they were, um, building an ethics and compliance department in the wake of investigations and debarment by the World Bank and, uh, and charges from the Canadian government and all that. And so I have this unique experience where, you know, a lot of lawyers will advise a company, oh, you need, you need a policy on your, or you need a code of ethics or you need a policy. So that to me is step one of a hundred steps. And so I have a real uh, experience and strength in what's called operationalizing an ethics and compliance program. And so that's uh, a, a real niche area that I have um, where I work with companies doing that as well. Perfect, thank you for that information. Um, and I know you said you do, you do a lot of work in the community. And as you mentioned, part of that community work is also um, teaching, teaching business law at Ryerson. And I wanted to um, know if you could tell us a little bit more about that part of your life and maybe what inspired you to go into teaching. Sure. Um, well, I was, I was on, I was in, invited to join in a, the advisory council for the law and business program at Ryerson. Um, the chair of that, of that council um, he does quite a lot of ethics work. And so that's how we originally got connected. And then a couple of years later, um, they were putting together this advisory council because Ryerson's one of, one of the few schools, I understand, one of the few universities that has an undergrad program in law. So there's this part of a program called Law and Business. And um, so I was already on the advisory council and um, I expressed an interest. I said, you know, one day in the future, like I would love to teach how, how does that work? And so he was able to point out some opportunities to me. And so I, I pursued those opportunities and then one, one of them worked out and it's been great. Like it's, um, I've done it in person and I've done it online. I also taught one course at Algoma University. They have a camp to campus. I'm located in the GTA, so they have a GTA campus. And it's one of those things where I was, to I was nervous. I was totally nervous when I was teaching, but then I just taught myself, okay, the students, like, why does it matter if I'm nervous? It doesn't matter if I'm nervous, right? The students are probably nervous or worried about the topic or, don't feel confident in the topic because it's their first time learning about it. So I really enjoyed it. Um, it's, it's work, obviously it's, it's hard work. And, you know, in my case, some of the topics was my first time looking at that topic 
since I learned about it in law school. Other parts of the topic were things that I did at work. And so I was more familiar with them. But I, um, you know, hats off to all the teachers out there. It's a, it's very, uh, it's a very tough job. Yeah, that's something I was also considering going into teaching. I said, I'm like, you know, if law doesn't work, I can, I can go into teaching. I don't know. I feel like I've always, I could see myself doing that too. But <laughs> that's, um, thank you for that. Um, and then just a couple more questions. This is personally one of my favorite ones that we ask on here. And it's, um, if you could go back in time before you were, uh, before you went to law school, before you became a lawyer and an entrepreneur, and you were able to talk to your younger self, um, what would you tell that person? I'd say worry less. <laughs> and I would say um, do more recreational stuff. Do more recreational stuff. Yeah, like exercise or <laughs> go out and get some fresh air or, or build build whatever tools of resilience are the right ones for you because it's not like you ever have more time for sure yeah I, I think um that's really important I especially now I feel like a lot of us for, forget about the recreational stuff forget about you know having time to ourselves. that's so m mental health is so important I'm very passionate about that as well um, so I always try to remind myself to save some time for myself to wind down a little bit because, you know, healthy body, healthy mind. <laughs> um, law, is a, law is a punishing profession. It is a very demanding profession. And I, they're starting to talk about mental health, but which is good because they didn't talk about it before. But just because people are walking or talking the talk doesn't mean the profession is walking the walk. And so as much as you hope your employer or your, the profession itself can support you in these ways, I don't think it's there yet. And so I really think it's very, it's vital for every young person who's considering law to really understand that, you know, statistically it has higher amounts of drug de dependency and alcoholism and just all, it has a lot of pressures and the people who, who are in the profession are not necessarily the best at recognizing that they need to have a healthier approach. So if those are the, those are the two things that I would have told myself, if I go back in time, that's what I would say. So I remember being in law school and I'm like, no, I can't go to the gym. I have to study. And it's like, it didn't help anyway. Like I probably would have done better if I had gone for a walk or, you know, um, just taking more time to have a more balanced life. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then finally, the last question I believe um, would be, you know, many of us are heading into the direction of becoming lawyers. I mean, that's something that I want to do. I know that that's something um, these two ladies who are watching, um, who are here right now also want to do. Um, and, you know, it could be very exciting, but it could also be very challenging and worrisome for a lot of people, I know, especially for myself. Um, so it, it could even be the same advice that you would have given your younger self. But I was wondering if there's any, you know, one piece of advice that you can give to the next generation of aspiring, you know, law professionals who want to follow in your footsteps, what would that be? Um, well, I would ask them why? Why do they want to be a lawyer? You know, and is it really what you want or is it what somebody else wants for you? Or do you want it because you don't necessarily know about other other options? Like, like I worked with engineers now for 18 years, uh, 19, 20 years, a long time. And I'm pretty sure when I graduated from high school, if you can believe this, I didn't know what an engineer was. Right. Um, and okay. so if I had never, if I didn't know what they did, how could I have ruled it out as a career? Mm -hmm. Right. How did I know law was going to be it for me if I didn't even know about all the other things I could do out there? So I think that um, 
I would ask people who are stressing out about it. It's like, why do you want to do it? Like cha challenge, challenge those, challenge those beliefs. And we you know why, why do you believe it's better than something else? Mm -hmm. I think the generic answer that, you know, a lot of people would get to that is helping people. But I think it goes way beyond that. You can help people. I mean, look, we've all just Russia. gone through COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Who were the people who were helping people the most? It was those frontline workers, sure. right? How would we have gotten through these last two years without people keeping the grocery stores open or the hospitals open or the teachers? So if people really, if helping people is really what they're after, there's many ways to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to discourage people. I just think that I don't think I don't think people necessarily um, have their eyes wide open. And there's lots of other tribute in this world. Um, so I it doesn't work out. I mean, I really believe that, you know, for every door that closes, something else opens. Yeah, for sure. That's what my mom was telling me this morning. Um, when uh, when a door closes, uh, a window opens. window opens. Yeah, no, I I hundred percent, I hundred percent believe that because really it's just, it's an outlook. It's an outlook on life, right? And and I do I do a lot of public speaking, and so one thing I also wanted to say, although I know that many of the viewers and listeners might be far away from this, I didn't get hired back when I articled. And and I try to say this when I talk to uh, younger people because it's something you spend a lot of time worrying about but it's like guess what it's totally fine you know I got laid off two years ago like guess what it was totally fine I'm not I'm not trying to minimize challenges that people have I'm just saying that don't become don't don't contribute or exacerbate the challenges you have because of how you think of that situation for sure i needed to hear that <laughs> no it's just it's, it's, honestly it's not life life is too short like mm -hmm. like i know i know to you guys i'm very old i've probably been a lawyer longer than some of you have been alive possibly or went to law school for some of you were even born but if you talk to anybody my age people are like i was 20 like yesterday how, how did how did this happen how did the time go so fast and so it's the same for all of you um things that today look like oh this is a real challenge i didn't get to work in the number one choice thing i wanted to work in well how do you know it's number one if you don't even know what the other choices are you don't know that mm -hmm. maybe the best thing that ever happened to you is that your plan didn't work out the way you necessarily thought, you know, I've always been like, I should have been an engineer, but I didn't know about it because I was too sheltered. My immigrant parents just told me there's lawyers and doctors and that's all I knew. Don't, don't, don't ask me why, I guess we didn't have the internet or something, but um, I even had an uncle who's an engineer, so I had no, I had no excuse. No, I don't blame you. When you said that you didn't know what an engineer was, um, like coming out of high school, the same. <laughs> a lot of my guy friends are just like, yeah, we're going to Waterloo for engineering. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's amazing. What is that? <laughs> but it is amazing, right? Like they, like they build stuff. Yeah. You know, and like I've worked with them for, for a very long time now. Um, and I'm just like, wow, like that, how awesome is that? Mm -hmm. Right? Like they're, I mean, and, and I, I'm sure I would feel that way about other professions as well. It's just that the other professionals I've worked with the longest have been engineers. For sure. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I think that's it for my questions. Thank you so much for answering all of them. And I'd love to pass the floor to um, either uh, Nagin or Aisha if you wanted to ask any questions. I see Nagin's raising her hand, so you can go ahead, Nagin. <laughs> okay. Hi, first of all, I wanted to thank you so much, Ms. Sanhu, for such an informative session and 
I'm so glad that we had the chance to invite you and your advice was very, very valuable. It's always an honor to be able to hear from someone with so much experience and so much wisdom. So thank you very much. My question for you would be that I understand that you obviously, you know, juggle many tasks at the same time. And, you know, you're such a, like, you're involved in so many different activities, whether that's your career, whether that's being a mom, whether that's, you know, involving yourself in outside organizations. So I wanted to ask you what, uh, I believe time management would be very important in order to make sure that you don't burn out and also that you're having a balanced lifestyle. So I want to ask you, what are your time management tips and advice to make sure that everything is balanced? Still a work in progress, and I would, going back to, uh, is it Christiane? I don't want to say your name wrong. I don't have my glasses on. Christiane's a question. Um, it is definitely something that if you feel like it's not a skill that you're strong in right now, definitely examine what it is you believe is not strong. I, I don't believe in following whatever is the latest trend or doing what your friends are doing. Like it has to work. It has to work for you in order for it to be sustainable. So, so right now, and I don't recommend this, but I'm just being honest. I start work often at 4 a.m. Okay. I was never a morning person. So it's not like at your age, I could have done this. But like last night, I went to bed at 9.30. So when I got up at 3.30, it wasn't terrible. And the reason I do that is I find for myself, if I start my day by getting some things completed, it's like this, the ball, like the snowball starts rolling. And so it just, for whatever reason, it just helps me be more productive for the rest of the day. And I like to keep my evenings free uh, to be with my children. Um, so that's, that's one thing for myself. I've hired a personal trainer um, because of two years of COVID, I've been sitting at home. So, you know, lots of costs went down. So I decided to splurge. Um, in my next birthday, I'll be 50. And so I just thought, if not now, when? I've been telling myself I'm gonna do this for the last like 30 years. So when is it gonna happen if not now? Um, but generally speaking, I find that only, only you know what's working for you. You can't compare yourself to other people. So I didn't do a lot of these things when my children were very small, right? I, I, mean, I, I, just, I, just, I just could not do it at that time. So there was probably many years where I didn't do anything other than work and home because that's, that's all that I could do at that time. And that was what made sense for my family. And now that I've started my own business, I have a lot more freedom and the freedom itself is energizing. So I, I am finding I'm operating on less sleep right now, but again, that's also short-term. And that's not the vision I have for my life or even like for the next month. So I think, I think, I think you need to prioritize your health, but that's going to look slightly different for every person. Um, depending on the activities you're involved in, they might give you a lot of energy, but if they're really causing you stress, then I think you really have to remove them from your life. You know, um, like when I was younger, this is a silly example, but I think many people can relate to it. When I was younger, if I started a book, I had to finish the book, even if I wasn't enjoying it, right? If I started a movie, I had to finish the whole movie. And as I got to a different place in my life, I was like, my life, I'm too, I'm too busy for that. And, and I'm out, my views are, my, I'm too important for that in the sense of, if this is a bad movie, it's not my fault. Like I'm, I'm walking out. The first time I ever did that, I felt such a sense of like freedom and power, right? Um, or if I'm reading a book and the book isn't, you know, isn't a great book, I'm like, you know what? There's a million books in this world. I'm never going to have time to read. Why am I wasting my time trying to finish this book just so I can check it off my list? I started it and I finished it. So I think, I think you have to find for yourself what is that balance of what does 
good uh, time management, but also good um, um, health management look like, like for you? You know, like maybe someone's really, really has a long history of sports or, or fitness or running. That person also has to manage their health so that they're not getting injured or they're not overtraining. So I think, I think what the key is, uh, and I'm not saying I have a perfect balance because I don't, I, I, I have to work at it. Um, I, think you, I think you have to think about why you are doing what you are doing. And if it fits into your values in a way that's clear to you, you know, I'm doing this for this reason. And either I see a short-term reason why I want to do it, or it's a long-term reason, you know, I'm connecting to the long-term benefit or or good feeling of being associated with it. You you have to answer these questions for yourself. And I really think you got to be careful about not making decisions based on what other people are deciding. You know, like I ran a marathon once. I'm never doing a second oh, wow. marathon because I'm like, this is like, like after 30 kilometers, I'm like, this is stupid for, for me, for me. Right. I would love to get fit enough again to run 10K and, and, and half marathons. But that full marathon distance, if that's your, if that's your thing, that's great. But I tried it and I'm like, that's not my thing. Mm-hmm. For sure, no, that makes sense. Thank you so much. All right. Um, I don't know if we have time for one more question. Aisha, if you if you want to ask a question, I don't mean to like put you on the spot. If you don't have any questions, that's fine. But like, <laughs> I have a question. I'm I'm gonna put it out there, but if we don't have the time to, you know, maybe if you still can't give like a really detailed answer, that's totally okay. Um, before I start super quickly, just want to repeat what Christiane and Nikina have been saying. Um, uh, as you can tell, we're very thankful. We keep saying thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and it's mainly because, like Nikina said, hearing from someone who has so much experience, we go to these sessions all the time. We've been doing this since I think it's March or April. And every time I go, I learn something new and I learn something different and it never feels repetitive. The questions that Christiane asks are usually around the same kind of topics, yet every time I leave with a new piece of advice or a new piece of information and one that really stood out to me of what you said is why, like ask yourself, why do you want to be a lawyer? Um, and I, I obviously founded a whole organization, so I, I hopefully really, really want to be a lawyer. Um, but even still, I'm, I'm sitting here and thinking, but why? And have I really considered other options? Not that I've, you've just created doubt in my mind. It's not that at all. If anything, if you do be, want to become one, it makes you feel more reassured and reaffirmed in your decision. Um, and I think for a lot of students, sometimes we like the idea of law or the idea of being a lawyer. Um, and we see it as going to court and, and being able to... Um, being of Legally Blonde, kind of like our own Legally Blonde movie. That's what I thought as a kid. Um, And so I'm glad that you're telling us to really, really think about our decision because you're right, it's a lot of commitment. Um, And I I thank you for asking that question again because that was my initial question. How do you do it all? Because it is very impressive. Um, You know, we just saw your kids come in too and and it's it's so hard to balance. Um, You know, we've seen it with, with our mothers and our, you know, sisters and just being a mom itself is so hard that in itself could be a full-time job um so you're really balancing multiple jobs at once um and I'm glad that you're giving us that advice of setting those boundaries for yourself um making sure that we know when to stop when to put it down realize that you can walk out and you know and you know what I just want to say it's going to be different for each of you Mm -hmm. right like and the other thing I'm going to say is I'm glad you see value in the advice, but you don't need that much advice, right? Do what's right for you. And the advice doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. If, if your path is clear to you and it makes sense to you and other people are saying, oh, don't do it. Why are they saying that? Right? Like, in my experience, and it's the same for me, you said, what would I tell a younger person or tell like my younger self that's a great question because I think a lot of advice is just well don't do that because I did that it didn't work out or don't do that because I didn't do it and so why should you do it 
like I'm not saying people are necessarily trying to uh, be unhelpful, but I just think that a lot of the times advice is framed around our own experiences. Mm -hmm. And you know what, like, I'm sure you've already started and you've already created this whole organization. Like what is there you can't do, right? Mm -hmm. So you guys go and you guys do awesome things and they're going to be awesome whether or not you are a lawyer or you're not a lawyer. And um, I wasn't so sure if I wanted to be a lawyer. I honestly, like, I, I don't know how it is for you guys. I, I feel like there might be some similarities. I was a child of immigrants. My parents gave up a lot to give us a good life. There's a lot of expectations about us studying, a lot of expectations about us being professionals and this and that, right? Like when I dropped out of uh, physics in high school, my dad's like, that's okay. You can still be a lawyer you know so and so I kind of fought against it because I felt like it was his idea not my idea and then when he finally got me to consider it seriously it was it was when he said it's an education it will open doors and you can do different things with your career strangely he said every five years you can do something totally different and it kind of worked out that way which has been, that's been the greatest joy for me. So I know lots of people might work in one place or one area of law and they become real experts at that thing. Like they're real specialists. Um, in my case, I worked at one company for a very long time. They got bought by another company. So in one respect, you can stay, say I was at the same place for 17 years. But it was totally different. The environment kept changing. Um, the work I did changed in, in my 21 years of being a lawyer. I think for 10 years, I did non-law work. I always kept my, paid my fees and I always kept my uh, status at the law society, but I did other stuff um, in the businesses that I worked in. And so that's always been exciting as well. So, so that's what I'm saying someone who started at law school the same day as me they might be like a senior partner in a big firm they might be like a super specialist in one very uh, niche area of the law but their path and my path are totally different and you know at some points in your life you're like oh my god i should have done what they did and at some points in their life they're like oh my god i should have done what she did but really it's just going to be unique to you and People are well-meaning in their advice, even me. But you just gotta, you just gotta have faith in yourself. Sorry, now I probably sound like your mom's. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like none of us can ever get enough of that, um, of hearing someone tell us that. And I agree that sometimes when people give their advice, it's clouded with their own experience because For obviously sure. you're going to speak about what you know. Of course, um, yeah. It can get a little too much when you're young. Um, I can see from my own experience when I tell people when I first started this and when I first started reaching out to lawyers, um, I did feel like I wasn't being taken seriously. And they would say, oh, law is way too hard. It's a lot of commitment. But it was with this negative rhetoric that was very kind of trying to deter me. There's a lot of unhappy lawyers. Yeah, and there's a lot. Yeah, it didn't really affect me because I was like, well, you don't like law. You didn't like it. Yes, you have more knowledge because you are at the end of the kind of journey and I'm at the beginning. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to enjoy it. And then there's yeah. a lot of lawyers who love what they do. A lot of lawyers who are in between about it. They love some aspects. They hate some aspects. And I think to people that are listening as well, um, the reason why we do these sessions is so that you can hear different perspectives. People who are in different fields have different things to say about it. Um, and, you know, like, I, I love the fact that you're an entrepreneur. So you went into a different direction. Instead of working for a firm, you started your own. And your own practice has its own benefits, its own pros and cons. Um, and it, it works for you. And some personalities, some people become a lawyer and they cannot work in a firm. That doesn't work for them. They prefer to have their own, like you said, be your own boss. So I like that with a law degree or with that path, you're not limited. Like you said, there's so much more you can do. So much. There's so much you can do. There's so much you can do. And, um, you know, I left Bay Street after two years. I'm like, I was like, this, this is not for me. And the main reason it wasn't for me was 
once I helped the client or I worked with the client, they went off and did their business. And I was like, but how did the, how did the deal go? You know, like what's, what's going on with that thing I helped you with? Hey. So I really liked being in house because I liked that involvement and where we're working on a project together. And then we can see where that project ends up that I discovered that was important for me and for other people, something else might be important. So you guys just, you know, I think, I think the key is have, have strength of conviction in your own ideas and what it is you want to do. And you know what, guess what? You're allowed to make mistakes too, or you're allowed to change your mind. You might go down a certain path and it really is satisfying for a certain amount of time. And then you find a different path that, uh, that speaks to you more. And that's, that's good. That's how it should be. For sure. Um, I think so we are, it is, 706 now okay. um, and I know that you are so busy so thank you so much for taking time out of your day for this um, and you can go spend the evening with your family thank um, you I'll do the same as well uh, for those of you that are watching the recording will be posted um, on our YouTube channel so you can view it and you can also leave comments if you would like um, I'm going to leave it to Christiane to wrap up the rest of the session for sure thank you so much Aisha Amy thank you so 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 much we probably thank you to like a hundred times but from the <laughs> bottom of our hearts we are so so thankful that you are here taking time out of your very busy schedule to be here um and yeah we hope you have a wonderful night and hopefully we hear we hear from you soon and good luck with your uh with your firm thank you and i have no doubt you guys are all gonna end up doing stuff that you're very proud of thank you so much amy have a good night <laughs> thank you take care